Have you ever wondered where the problems in the world today would exist if we had deeper connection to ourselves, others, and the environment, and acted from that place? Welcome to the Conscious Action Podcast with your host, Brian Burneman, who believe that connection is the key to taking conscious action as individuals and creating a better world. We are here to raise awareness and inspire meaningful action by sharing stories, knowledge, and conversations with thought leaders and change makers. From sustainability to well-being and everything related to conscious living, our mission is to empower you to be the change that you want to see in the world. Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Conscious Action Podcast. I am Brian Berneman, your host, and I have the pleasure to be showing all the way from San Jose in California in the US by Scott Shoot. Thank you so much, Scott, for taking the time. Once again, uh, lovely to, to connect with you. And for everyone that is listening to us, everyone that is watching us, what can you share about you? Who is Scott? <laughs> Ah, <laughs> that's a big question. Who is Scott? <laughs> well, I had a pretty interesting job. I was the head of mindfulness and compassion programs at LinkedIn. And people usually want to know, how, how did that happen? What, how did you get that kind of job? Um, well, there's a part of me that has had a career as an executive. I was the VP of global customer operations at LinkedIn, kind of during the high growth time of LinkedIn. It was a big job. I had a thousand people in my organization. So there's that part of my life. And the other part of my life is that since 13, I've had a contemplation, a meditation practice. I've been teaching those types of classes since I was in college. It's a huge part of my life and one that I never brought to work until I got to LinkedIn. But LinkedIn was such an amazing kind of open place that I started just by leading one meditation session there. And that first time, there was one person, just me and one other person. <laughs> and from there, it kind of snowballed. You know, then there were three, and then there were five. Then I got invited to do bigger things. You know, the CFO would have um, an offsite with three or 400 people and invite me to kick it off with a meditation, things like that. And for a long time, I volunteered. For three or four years, I volunteered until... Over time, I finally turned it into my full-time job. Our CEO was out in the world talking about compassion. In fact, he gave the commencement address at Wharton, you know, very, very serious Wharton, and talked about compassion. And then he was on TV the next day talking about compassion on a morning show. And I was thinking, okay, it's time. It's time for me to take this next leap in my career, uh, but it's also time for LinkedIn to, to put our money where our mouth is. So I made a pitched to our CEO, and with his great support, we created this role. Uh, and I did that for three years. I was the head of mindfulness and compassion programs. And now I'm out in the world the last two and a half years. I wrote a book. I'm out in the world trying to help other companies and other leaders be more conscious leaders and be successful while they're doing it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing. You know, it's one of the, the things, Scott, that I just love hearing people's journeys. Um, it makes such a an interesting um, understanding on on how we got to where we are and understanding, you know, as well. Because I tell a lot of times to people, you know, like as you said, you started with just one person, you know, like attending that. We start where we start. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And that's, that's always right. important to 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 understand, you know, what do we also want to do, and well, that's right. people might receive it or not. That's right. And a lot of people ask me, like, how do you, how do I get that job? How did you, and how do I get that job? And I always say, you just start doing it. Like, whatever the work is, you just start doing it. Whatever, whatever you're able to contribute, whatever you're passionate about, just start it. And what I found is I just started it and I found all these people, all these other people who wanted to do it with me. And together, you know, we had more, we had more, we had more power together than we did separately. But then as I was doing it, I did it for three or four years. Then as it became ripe, you know, the time was ripe. And, and if I said, if I had said to my CEO, I want to do this job, he's like, well, do you even meditate? No, that wasn't the conversation. I said, I want to do this job. And I've been doing it for four years and I've been speaking on stage and I've led over a thousand meditations during this time. And, 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 and by that, I had already created my own resume for the job by doing it for free. 
Yes. And I would love to know, Scott, a little bit. Let's go back. You said, you yeah. know, since you're for, since you are 13 that you've been in this contemplative space. What yeah. like how did that happen? Like who introduced you to that <laughs> sure. and, 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 and what was that? <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm the youngest of five. I grew up on a farm in Kansas for your listeners that is in the middle of America, very rural part of America. And I always had this deep connection, in my opinion, deep connection to nature, to the universe, to the divine, whatever you want to call it. Um, and since I was maybe 10 or 11, I was looking for something else. We had a, you know, kind of the family tradition, the, the family religion that we were attending, but it, it didn't make any sense to me. I, I was looking for something different. And my brother, an older brother who was trying to make a living as a guitar player, a bass guitar player, tour, touring America, he found something different. And when he came back and over time uh, shared that with me, I just felt like I had come home, mm -hmm. like I had been separated from something for lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. I had finally returned like two parts of a magnet that had been reunited. And part of that practice, you know, the whole path is about an individual path and and developing our own connection with the divine, our own relationship with the divine. Part of that is a contemplative practice, you know, using mantras and other things. And uh, it's been with me ever since. It's been a big part of my life ever since. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. You know, I, I, it's interesting because, <clears throat> excuse me, I got into these practices that now, of course, it's been changing through the years as they evolve and everything. But it was as a young kid as well, through my parents, mm. that they were on their own journey of trying to understand mm. and, and and grow themselves. And mm. I realized as well that in what I grew up before that, I didn't connect with some like there was something that I knew there's more or there's something mm. different. And mm. I started to to connect with all of this and, and I'm so grateful that I've been able to to find this. Because now, you know, since I was a, a young kid, I was able to to explore more and more about myself, to explore and have that contemplative, that inquiring perspective to try to mm. understand how am I actually being, what's going on. And when mm. things are happening, you know, challenges in life, then mm. how am I being with that? How can I navigate this? How can I respond to that? And this is one That's of the right. things that... I'm sure that you get this a lot with, with the people that you have worked through the years. Most people haven't been fortunate to actually get this. They are on survival mode and they That's are right. so stressed and they don't know what to do. They don't know, you know, where to find the answers. Yeah. And there are answers. <laughs> we just don't That's know right. them. That's right. Yeah. I think that uh, the survival mode is a good way to put it. We're, at the root of it, we're animals, right? We're homo sapiens. We're an animal. We don't want to admit it often, but everything we do is because we're an animal. We we evolved this way mm -hmm. from the food that we eat to our obsession with sex and war and everything. It's because we evolved this way to stay alive. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll draw the distinction between, you know, happiness or joy and just being alive. You know, staying alive is a low bar. Most of us want more than that now. And when we've been trained, we've been trained to attain, get as much as we can so we can increase our, chance, increase our chances of survival. But the real game, the, not game, the real point is to attune. So moving from attaining to attuning. And like you said, from this deeper place, when we can tune into that deepest place, we can start to see the answers. We can start to see the next steps more clearly where before it seemed hopeless. So I think mm. it's critical that each of us learn this power of attuning. Mm, beautiful. It's it's one of the things, you know, a lot of times through the years, I, I tell a lot of my clients, you know, as you're just pointing out, it's, you know, it's okay to survive, but, you know, surviving is not living well. Surviving is mm. not, you know, um, going to our full potential. Mm. Surviving is not, as you're saying, that attunement. I use a lot of times the word alignment or balance. Like mm -hmm. 
it's okay to be on surviving if that's what we are. There's more mm -hmm. and there's different ways of doing things. And one of the things that with you, like I want to explore a lot today is like using this at work because the reality is, yes. you know, we, we spend as adults, most of our days either sleeping or working. <laughs> mm, and, that's right. And I was, you know, fortunate to be able to have the experience of understanding how to use work as the space mm. for my development as a human being, not only just mm. my work. And that's part of what I bring into the spaces that I work with. And I know this is what you do. So can you share a little bit, you know, you started with LinkedIn sure. doing this. What it is that now you're sharing on this space? Sure, sure. So I left LinkedIn two and a half years ago or so, and I'm working with other leaders and companies and trying to help them become more conscious. What does that mean? So there's a framework, right? And the high level framework for a company, let's start at the company and we'll work our way towards the individual. For a company, it's about moving from me to we. It's about moving from just thinking about the shareholders and the finances to thinking about all of the stakeholders involved and trying to create a balance for all of those stakeholders. And turns out this is not just a feel good thing. We, companies are actually more successful when they do this. So to on purpose, kind of move away from the short term thinking of the quarterly report to the longer term thinking of balance. Balance, yes, my shareholders I have to make money to stay in business but also to create a great environment for employees so they can do their best work and to create great value for our customers so they stay with us longer. And when we're doing this, we're solving for the whole, but when we solve for the whole, we're solving for us, one of us, each part of one of us. So that's the high level structure. And I, you know, what we talk about is creating goals and structure and intention to build the system that makes that happen. Okay, then you might imagine, all right, what do I do as an individual? And so my, the book that I wrote is called The Full Body Yes, but the subline is change your work and your world from the inside out. And it's this inside out part, which is what I really mean. And that's sometimes the tricky part. We often want, we want to change the world. Okay, one of my favorite quotes is from Rumi. Um, Rumi said, you know, yesterday I was clever and I was trying to change the world but today I'm wise and I'm working on changing myself. And this is about our individual consciousness. And so what at the root of it, I believe that we can have joy, not just survival, but pure, true joy, regardless of our surroundings. Even if we work in a toxic environment, even if we work for a bad manager, all the things, we can still have joy. We can be in charge of our own response to life. So there's lots of techniques in the you know, personal development and the spiritual development world that will allow us to live that life. But some of the basics start at the same place, which is moving from me to we, right? If I move from just thinking about my own needs and my own success to thinking about, well, how can I help those around me? How can I help my team? How can I help the people I serve? Then it gives me a little, this is a starting place to make work a little bit more meaningful. So that's where I start. Beautiful. I love that, you know, changing work from the inside out, because this is one of the things that I often find that, you know, as I change myself, I change my circumstances as we right. do, as you're saying, as we start to understand the impact that how we are doing our own things, when we take responsibility and we actually look into how we are showing up then that makes a difference with the people around us. If we That's want right. to have that, you know, effect that is rippling out, then we need to start with ourselves. And That's when right. we are able to understand this balance between the inner and the outer, as you say, you know, like there's that perspective change on, okay, starting with myself and then that's given results. It's one of the things yeah. that I often say to the, like every time that I'm going to potentially work with a, a new business, 
the last stages, you know, like the people that are going to actually hire and spend the money <laughs> in in my services. And they often say, you know, like, why would we invest in this? And I'm like, you, you know, understanding the importance of, as you're saying, all of your stakeholders, understanding the importance of your employees. If your employees are not well, if they don't feel like they are a part of this, if they don't feel that they are actually being taken care of as a person, not just as a cog in the machine, right. then they are not going to stay there. They are not going to be motivated to actually go above and beyond. They are not going to create a better environment. They are not going to That's support right. the customers, as you're saying, to make sure that the customers are also being taken care of. Mm -hmm. And if they actually have all of that, then the company is going to actually make more money, which if mm -hmm. that's a goal, productivity is going up. As you say, like mm -hmm. this is all of the businesses that actually employ people to work with well-being of their employees. All of their productivity is high. <laughs> yeah, that's right. In today's world, in the digital age, most companies aren't selling hard goods anymore. They're, of course, there still are companies, but there's a lot of companies where their primary product is data or a bigger portion of their business is data, which means by far their biggest asset, their biggest resource is the people. Uh, and even the companies who are building cars and building products, it's still the designs, it's still the customer service, it's still the relationships. So people are by far our interest, most important resource. But if you imagine a world, if we lived in a manufacturing economy, right, in the industrial revolution part of our world, and you had a machine that was responsible for 80% of your productivity, and that machine is humming along in the corner, and you know it's the most valuable asset you have, but the machine is only operating at 50% of maximum or 60% at maximum. Would there be any discussion at all about the need to maintain that machine or the need to upgrade the machine so that it could operate at 100%? Of course not. But here we are with our people and they're not operating at 100%. It's not necessarily their fault. It's, it's just that it's a chaotic world. And there are tools that would help each one of us as individuals operate at a higher level, operate with higher joy, operate with higher creativity, operate with higher sense of peace, higher sense of trust. And of course, all of those things lead to productivity, which is good for everybody involved. Mm. Yes, I love that. You know, it's, I actually, I remember I asked one of the uh, HR people in one of the businesses that she was like, I'm not sure if we have, you know, like one hour to actually, you know, stop work <laughs> and and i ask her you know what you're saying about you know operating in that capacity i ask her okay between us let, let's be let's be like truthful here how many hours of your day are you actually presently focused working because mm. majority of people even if they are eight hours in an office mm. they are not working at full capacity for eight hours they are taking breaks, they are daydreaming, they are stressed or their nervous system is not actually working properly, so they cannot focus properly. They have yeah. so much stuff that all in all, mostly like people are not working at full capacity for more than two and a half hours a day <laughs> of the eight hours. Sure. So people do have that one hour or whatever long it is to actually explore, as you're saying, sure. maintaining or upgrading. <laughs> It's interesting. I think that all of these things are on a journey. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, four or five years ago, I was visiting my mom in Kansas and we, we were looking for something to do. So we went to uh, an antique store. And at the antique store, they had this big pile of Time and Life magazines from the 60s and 70s. And I was about to turn 50. And so I was looking for magazines from 1969, which was the year of my birth. And I wanted to see what was the world like when I came into it. You know, I knew that in the summer of 69, we put a man on the moon, you know, from America. And I was reading these magazines. And I mean, in some ways, things had changed radically. In some ways, they hadn't changed at all. 
So as an example, there were advertisements for cigarettes and the pitch man, the advertising man was always a man, uh, was a doctor in a lab coat holding a cigarette, talking about the benefits of nicotine in the afternoon as a natural energy boost. <laughs> and there's, there was an article about a swim team in Iowa, another U.S. Midwestern state. And the swim team had just won a big championship two years in a row. So the, the um, journalists went to see what was going on. Why, did, why were they winning? And the headline in big, bold letters was, swimmers subject themselves to self-torture in order to win. And I was thinking, what, what, what are they doing? My mind was racing, right? They're swimmers. So are they waterboarding? Are they electroshock therapy? Like what, what are they doing that's so crazy? Okay, in 1969, you wanna know what was so crazy? They were doing strength training. They were, they were lifting weights. But this was cutting edge, you know, in 19, it was considered self-torture. And I went on to read more about like, and realized that our journey with physical exercise is really new. Our grandparents did not exercise for fun. Right? They worked hard, but they weren't running. Running didn't even happen really for fun until the 70s and 80s hmm. when Nike came along and others. And so this world of physical exercise is relatively new. Let's call it 50 years. But now everybody, including people at work, everybody knows that exercise is good for you, that diet is good for you, that if you exercise, you're going to be healthier. If you're healthier, you're probably going to do better work. And so the mindfulness journey is just a little bit further along where people not really sure what it is. They have some experience with it. We're starting to talk about it more. Even in the last 10 years, we've moved from number of people who have meditated being in the single digits to something like 50 or 60% in the last 10 years. So it's coming. It's coming to the point where 30, 40 years from now, everyone at work will treat mindfulness and mental exercise just in the same level of normalcy, normalcy, whatever the mm. word is, uh, <laughs> that they do with physical exercise. Mm, yes. And, you know, uh, it's one of the things as well, anything that is new, it takes time for people to to adopt it mm. and to, to be able to be open to it. And I think as you're saying, like, I'm seeing more and more openness within this space. Mm. And of course, you know, I... I I tell a lot of times to, to some of my clients, I know that in some spaces that I work, I use a certain language. In another place, I use another language because, yeah. you know, if people are not open to some Eastern mm, philosophies or if they are not open to more of a spiritual language, they mm. understand that using certain words are going to actually put them off. And we need sure. this as people. So it's like, it is my job to be able to connect with them and to understand, okay, they need other language to understand how it is that they can actually potentially benefit from doing these things to implement these things in their lives so that they are actually better. And then perhaps they open themselves to that path and it's like, oh, there's something in there. But as long as they are able to just connect with themselves, this is one of the things that I that I tell people a lot, you know, meditation. A lot of people think so many different things about meditation. And at the end, I always say meditation is about being present and connected. Mm. How? Like there's so many different ways. But for sure, it's, it's the movement. That. That's right. I talk about it as the movement from attaining to attuning. Right. We move just to that quiet way of like, how do we connect inside with something deeper? And everybody knows, I think, what that feels like to be quiet and still within us when, you know, there's a part of us that it just knows a part of us, which just a better version of us. Mm. And it's attuning a to that part of us. Mm -hmm. Scott, I, I would love for you to, to share a little bit. You talked about, um, conscious business before a little bit mm. um what what is a conscious business or how does a business that is let's call it sure. unconscious for a better <laughs> like uh, <laughs> word now uh how do they move there you know what 
what is the gap that you're seeing and you're experiencing with those that you're working sure. with? Sure, sure. I think it starts with intention, right? A lot of people, if you just view a business as only making money, and it doesn't really matter how we make money or why we make money or what we do with the money, that's not great, right? Because it can't, I mean, sometimes it could have good results, but a lot of times it doesn't because the intention doesn't say anything about our value system. So if we simply move from this idea that we're in business to make money, yes, but we're also going to be a force for good in the world. Mm -hmm. We're going to do good for our shareholders, our customers, our employees, and the broader environment that we live in. That simple shift to say, we want to benefit all stakeholders. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Because from there, you can start to choose, as an example, for employees, If we have the choice that we want to make this a great environment for our employees so that they can do their best work, so that they can thrive, so that they can move towards joy instead of just survival, mm -hmm. then that create that intention can create a whole different set of choices around policy. Mm -hmm. Right. And some of the policies are striking. So as an example, uh, this is kind of an ex extreme one, but it's it's valid. You know, what happens if there's a death in the family? Right. A lot of companies say, well, you get 48 hours. Like, really? Okay, my grieving is going to be done in 48 hours, like no matter who died. Right. Mm. Where other companies, they might have, they may, as an example, have the same 48 hour policy, or it might be a week. But if the manager has the, the ethos of, of taking care of their employees, they say, you know what, Scott, I know your father just died. Why don't you take whatever time you need? The work will be here when you get back. Just let us know how we can support you. The difference between these two things is pretty stark, right? Because at the root of every experience, we are a human experiencing the world as a human. Mm -hmm. The single biggest factor in creating a high-performing environment, a high-performing team is psychological safety. Back to that fight or flight, back to survival, right? If I can move out of fight or flight into a place of safety, then I'm going to be more creative. I'm going to be more productive. I'm going to be more loyal to the company. So back to your question, it always starts with intention. And from those intentions, then the choices are going to be very mm, much more clear than they were before when there was no intention. Yes. You know, Scott, I, I just heard something what you're saying that going back to what you mentioned and that started in your journey in LinkedIn with this about the compassion that creating a safe space psychologically for people has to do a lot with bringing compassion as you know as beings to understand that we're working with other human beings and to understand that as leaders And it doesn't matter if someone is a manager or, or whichever position, we can be leaders in this and yeah. bringing compassion into the workplace and to understand, you know, we are dealing with other people that they are going through stuff and how can yeah. we better support them? That's right. That's right. Mm. That's right. It's, it's this simple movement from me to we, right? When we're in an environment where we're only looking up for ourselves, that's the, that's the survival environment. That's the survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. And moving away from animal into conscious being, and you can start to think about others, you think about how we fit in, how there's really no separation between us at all, that everything is just energy and we're just all part of the cosmic soup of energy. And you start realizing that, wow, if I help you be successful, I'll be successful too. That is the, the single, you know, high level intention that changes everything. When we move to, from survival into a world where mm, we're trying to be of service or we're trying to be compassionate. Mm -hmm. And one, one thing yeah. I would say, um, some people think that compassion is soft. <laughs> It's like, oh, you're going to be compassionate. So like what now everybody's just nice to each other. Or if there's performance issues, we don't address them. And this is not at all what I'm saying. Of, in fact, I think it's a disservice, as example, as a leader, 
If someone's having performance issues, it's a disservice to them to say, oh, I'm not going to deal with that because I want to be compassionate. It's actually the opposite of being compassionate, right? So compassion is, here, my definition for compassion is, first of all, the capacity, because our capacity ebbs and flows all the time, day by day, minute by minute, for three things. The first is, do I have an awareness of another person? Do I have a mindset of kindness towards them or wishing the best for them? And third is, do I have the courage to take action? All right, well, so in a work environment, I'm balancing compassion for my customers, my shareholders, and my employees, right? So in that balance, if there's one part of that that's not operating appropriately, I'm going to take action. And so compassion can be fierce, but it's done from a perspective of solving for the whole, including me, including you, and including everybody else. Mm. Yes, I love that. You know, I, I, I often say for me, compassion is about understanding. And my teacher is to say, um, one of my teachers is to say that compassion is being moved to take action through understanding, through empathizing, through mm. having that space where we actually understand there's something needed here. Mm. I'm taking action. And, and you, as you say, you know, how the action is might be different. Some, sometimes it looks really gentle and sometimes mm. it might seem a little bit harsh, but we need mm. to look at it from, as you're saying, all of the perspectives, because Correct. as you say, like, this is about being just nice and that's it. And we're just going to tiptoe around the, the <laughs> challenges, you know, like that's there are right. real things going on. That's right. And interestingly enough, self-compassion is the, exactly the same recipe, right? Our capacity to, do I have awareness about myself? Do I really understand my motivations and what I'm trying to do? The second part is, do I have a mindset of kindness towards myself? Or, you know, you could say, do I love myself? And then third is, do I have the courage to take action? Like once I see these things, am I courageous enough to do the hard things in life so that I could have joy instead of just survival? Can mm. I take action on my behalf? Mm. So it, I think it starts, I think compassion starts with self-compassion and the work on ourselves. Uh, I wrote this book kind of during COVID time called The Full Body Yes, And it was in response to people would ask me like, okay, you're the head of mindfulness compassion programs at LinkedIn. What does it even mean to be compassionate? And when I went to start writing, I wanted to write a book about being a compassionate leader. But what I realized, wow, 90 or maybe 99% of being a compassionate leader is first developing ourselves. And included in that is the self-compassion part. Mm. And how do you share in, in, in your book that full body yes? I, I know mm. what it, you know, what it looks like for me. And I often say to people that, you know, sometimes I, I hear people saying like, go with your feeling, you know, like just mm. trust that. And and I always say, stop, let, let's stop. Like, yes, that's a great advice, but people mm. might not know what it's an actual yes, mm. because they have been programmed or conditioned or they have, for mm. whatever reason, they had to dissociate from their experience. So mm. therefore, they are not in that full body yes. Mm. It's a really good question. And the answer is a little tricky. For one, I think that this developing of our internal guidance system is really critical. Because as an example, because things are not black and white, they're gray all the time. So if you ask me, okay, what's your favorite thing to eat? I would say, oh, great. It's my mom's cherry pie. Right. So after dinner, do you want some cherry pie? Sure. Full body. Yes. Great. Okay. Do you want a second piece? Well, the mind says, well, my favorite thing to eat is cherry pie. Oh, I, I guess I'll have another piece. But about three quarters of the way through the second piece, you're like, oh, this is not the best thing I ever ate anymore. And if you had to eat a third piece and a fourth piece or a fifth piece, by the fifth piece, it's like poison. Because you just can't, you can't do it anymore. Well, this is exactly like life. In some situations, the answer is A. 
it, given a choice between A and B. And in some situations, given a choice between A and B, the answer is B. And how do I know the answer is B versus A? It's a development of this internal listening system. So with the cherry pie example, I know my body. I can get away with one piece of pie, maybe one and a half. I cannot get away with four pieces of pie. <laughs> so what is it? What is the full body yes? I think it's when our values are aligned. It's when our mind and emotions are quiet. And we've listened to that deepest part of ourselves and we're in tune with it. Mm -hmm. When we're in tune with the deepest part and the mind and the body and the emotions and every fiber of our being says yes, then that's it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not that easy though. Sometimes we get the inner guidance, but the mind is chattering. The mind is like, yeah, but what about, what about, what about? And so I think this is one of those skills that takes constant practice, constant practice, because today's answer might be cherry pie. Five years from now, cherry pie may definitely be the wrong answer. Mm. Yes, <laughs> I love that. And you know, Scott, I, I, I often share for me, one of the biggest things that helped me was reconnecting with my body and my feelings, mm. because mm. I was disconnected. I was just in my head. And, and I always say, there's nothing wrong with our minds, with our brains. They are mm. amazing. We just mm. need to align and integrate with all of our parts to be able to actually get to what you're saying, that full body, yes. That it's not yeah. just that chattering in the mind, which we can use. It's a deeper yeah. thing. And, and I often share, you know, this is an experiential thing. I cannot tell you what your full body, yes, is going to be. Just yeah, like you cannot right. tell me. It's an experience that through time and practice mm. and connection with our souls, we start to attune using your word there to be yeah. able to see like, this is can it. We do, can we do an exercise in 90 seconds? Yes. So if you're listening and you too, Brian, think about a choice that you need to make in life. And maybe it's something you've been thinking about for a while. Maybe it's something big, maybe it's something small, whatever. But choose between two things and label them in your mind. One is A and one is B, right? Got it? Something you're choosing. A is one thing and B is the next. Okay, here we go. So go ahead and if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes and just relax your body for just a second. And imagine that you have chosen A. A is now a part of your life. And just see how that feels in your body. You've chosen A. You are a person with A in your life. Maybe even let the repercussions of your choice reverberate. In other words, think about the future for a little bit. The next day, the next month, the next year. How does choosing A feel to you? And what does it lead to? You are a person who has chosen A. Notice how that feels. Okay, take a deep breath. Let it go. Think about something different. Think about an orange rhinoceros. <laughs> All right, now imagine that you have chosen B. B is now part of your life. And notice how that feels in your body. Maybe even play it forward. What does tomorrow, the next month, the next year look like with B in your life? And how does that feel? Notice how that feels in your body. Take one more deep breath in. Let it all go. You can open your eyes. Okay. Brian, did you get any new information from that exercise? I did. Thank you. It was actually really helpful because I was in between two choices now for <laughs> something that I needed to invest in. So <laughs> thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> now, what I'd say is this is another piece of information, right? It's just another piece of information. I find that when I do this, I always get more information. Some, sometimes it's really clear, like really, really, really clear. And sometimes I need a little bit more information. That's where the mind or the emotions or other things can be helpful.
mm. but it's always useful for me. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for for sharing that that practice with with all of us, yeah, Scott. Sure. I would love, as we are starting to get towards the the end of our conversation, I would love for you to to share a little bit more about what you're doing now, changing sure. work. Like sure. share a little bit, you know, like what is the aim? What I know that mm -hmm. this is as a collective as well. You know, it's not just a, like a me thing. Um, can sure. you share a little bit around that? Sure. Well, my mission in life is to change work from the inside out, as you may have gathered. And when I left LinkedIn a couple of years ago, I started as a speaker and a coach and a facilitator. And I realized with this mission, oh, it's going to take way more than me to change anything with 3.5 billion of us in the workplace. So along with my co-founder, Nicholas, we started this thing called the Changing Work Collective. And the idea is that a group of us first together, practitioners, people that are coaches and facilitators and podcasters and authors and solopreneurs, all together, get together, and we're more powerful. We're stronger together than we are apart. And so that's the first part of the collective is to help each one of those people be more successful so they can be, you know, so they can have a, a multiplication effect. The second part, the second phase is then to curate the best practices the best practices of conscious business to make it available to the rest of the world, to enterprise businesses, to leaders, so that they have the best practices so they can go into their companies and change work. And then the third phase would be offer all of these things to individuals, you know, whether they work in a great environment or not, they can change their own world from the inside out. One of the projects I'm really excited about, we're kicking off in the next couple of weeks is we're going to write a book together. You know, the idea is that 20 or 25 of us each write a chapter, 2,500 words or whatever. And one of my friends reached out and said, oh, this is really interesting. This is what the Quakers do. You know, the Quakers write books together um, as a way of continuing their understanding of the divine, to deepen their understanding of the divine. And I thought, oh, this is exactly what we're doing. We're going to write this book together to deepen our understanding of conscious business, to deepen our understanding of what works now in today's world. So I'm really excited about that and all the other stuff we have cooking. Mm, beautiful. I love that, you know, as, as someone that actually is partly doing this type of work, I, I feel it's so important as well to create connection, to create collectives, to, to move as you're saying from the mid to the we, uh, and that is in all parts of, of our of our life you know we are all in a sense connected we are living a very individualized life and we need to be able to to change that so I, I love that you're creating this this collective and Scott for anybody that perhaps is listening and they are doing this or they're more interested about the, sure. the work that you're doing how can they connect where can they find yeah. you Beautiful. Come find us at changingwork.org. Um, I'll give you a coupon code for a bonus free month. You can use the coupon code podcast24, like the year 24, podcast24. And you can find me there or at scottshoot.com. Uh, feel free to reach out. I'm all over the place. You can find me on LinkedIn and lots of other places, uh, but would love to hear from you. Love to be, I would love to create something with you. So come join us. Mm, beautiful. Thank you, Scott, for, for that. For everybody listening, let us know in the comments, whatever it is that you're finding in this episode, what resonated with you? What are you already doing, you know, from these perspectives that Scott has been sharing? What is it that perhaps you are wanting to incorporate? Let us know your experience. Let us know any insights that you got from, from this conversation. And... Um, Thank you so much, Scott, for taking the time for this beautiful conversation. Thank you for the work that you're doing in bringing about this change you know, to work from the inside out as this is going to be supportive for the collective as well, just in general, outside of work as well. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, once more. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll see you all on the next episode. Bye. <laughs> What did you like the most about this episode? Take a moment to think about what change you can make in your life today. 
Share your conscious action on social media using hashtag conscious action and tagging at conscious action and said so we can celebrate your impact on the world and create a ripple effect. One easy action we would love for you to take right now is to share, like and subscribe to this podcast. This will help us get these messages out into the world and inspire more people to take conscious action in their own lives, contributing to the better world we hope for.